Hey, everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we've got Costi Hen, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys, stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. If you're not aware of Costi, man, I've been trying to get Costi on this program for a bit. He's moved. Uh, There's a sickness in the family. There was some difficulty. But finally, after three years of trying to make the schedules work and getting an assistant who can actually faithfully send emails uh, and coordinate things, uh, uh, we've finally gotten Costi on the program, and we're really excited to have him here with us. In fact, if I remember correctly, the first time that we talked about having Costi on was when his cousin Will Hart was on. Will Hart. Will Hinn was on the show many years ago, back in 2017. I think. So I started that conversation and relationship with Costi and excited to have him on the program today to talk about the Holy Spirit. But before we dive into the subject and introduce our guest, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. And if you want to support the channel, there are links in the description to do so. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or be a recurring giver on Patreon. If you choose to give on Patreon, you'll get access to extra content. Without further ado, here are my buddies. Uh, This is Michael Roundtree on the left and Costi on the right. Before I introduce Costi, Michael, are you excited about this program? In, I definitely am. I definitely am. Yeah. I think uh, Costi's story of just uh, and and actually, Costi, I'd like I'd love for you to share that story. Maybe just kind of a little bit of your experience between uh, just the charismatic side and then uh, and then the other side, and just I, I think that must play into the reasons you wrote the the book that you did. And maybe you could even tell us a little bit about that book. But super excited. Wearing my Texas hat today, even though I'm in Oklahoma, but I spent about 40 years in Texas. So uh, anyway, yeah, so doing really well, Josh. And uh, Costi, just to kind of volley it over to you, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, about yourself, about your ministry, and about this book that you have? I think it's coming out tomorrow. So maybe just kind of all of that. Yeah. So about me, I am married to an amazing woman. She's so faithful and godly and is my best friend. And together we have five children and currently drive a minivan, but I am, I think I'm done, but in God's providence, if there's more, we'll be (laughs) crowdfunding a sprinter van soon. Uh, So we're having fun. We we planted a church uh, 18 months ago called Shepherd's House Bible Church in Chandler, Arizona. So we're out here in the East Valley, uh, not far from Phoenix at all, about 20, 25 minutes. And in the, like the Scottsdale area is another landmark people may know. And Shepherd's House has grown. We are mainly focused on the depth of ministry. We want the word to be preached and disciple people and share our lives with them and grow faithful uh, with our gospel ministry and, and work. But uh, God has given us good problems. We have uh, some 800 people now. It's grown fast. And so that kind of leads me to why even more uh, we do resources. I have a ministry called For the Gospel. The tagline is Sound Doctrine for Everyday People. We put it, we use media and put out a lot of resources that are doctrinal, practical, and we want to have truth in what we say, but also be winsome and be gracious and yet draw lines where the Bible does and be clear, uh, being bull dogmatic where Scripture is, and certainly spreading the gospel. So we do that. And part of that effort is writing, and I publish books in order to support my church and people with doctrine, and I love to write. I enjoy it. It helps me process information and study, and it's such a tremendous privilege. My wife is really supportive of it, so uh, we wrote some children's books as well. One of them is called uh, In Jesus' Name I Pray. It's about a squirrel who learns what it means to really pray in Jesus' name, and that's out. And then we have a Fruit of the Spirit series starting in February with the king who found his self-control. And so lots of projects. And the reason for that is I find people are so hungry. They want the truth. They want the word. They want to grow. And one of the topics that continues to be prevalently uh, in, in dire need is the topic of the Holy Spirit, which just doctrinally we call that pneumatology. And the reason I wrote the book is not necessarily what some people might think, because I came out of what I would say is heresy, the prosperity gospel, like word of faith movement, just complete twisted view of the gospel. And on the charismatic side, but definitely the charismatic extreme side, 
And now it would be, I think I'd be considered like a, I'm just a Bible guy, but people would call me like a reformed Baptist or whatever. Um, I don't know what all, every label that somebody would want to use, but you could say I'm reformed ish. I'm not like liturgy and, and Presbyterian reformed. I'm like, you know, even reformed people say I'm lowercase r reformed because I'm still premillennial. Yeah. I, I held a lot of my eschatology still after studying and coming out of the Pentecostal world. All that being said, that kind of gives people categories. It wasn't either of those that drove me to write. The study that came out not long ago by Arizona Christian University, they're right in our backyard. They did this big study. And in the study, 58% of people did not believe the Holy Spirit was God. And I'm sitting there reading it, going, just losing my mind, spiritually speaking, and just my burden for people. And as a pastor, going, how in the world? This isn't even like charismatic versus you know, reformed. This isn't cessationism versus continuationism. This is like baseline. We're supposed to, we should have debates about those other things like at a family table because we're all believers. This though, this is, this is terrible. So I start looking into research and doing some other research. I find like a Ligonier study. Another one I think was published by Lifeway where people who claim to be evangelical Christians don't necessarily know what to do with the Holy Spirit. Either they don't believe he's God. Some believe he's a force, a mystical force. Others uh, didn't really know which category to put him in. Like, is he his own person or is he the spirit of Christ? Or is he uh, like a just a, a different thing entirely? All of that burdened my heart greatly. We're in the middle of planting a church. And I thought, man, if there's one thing among all of the other essentials that I want to make sure we get right, I've written on the gospel I wrote a book called More Than a Healer, which is really about Christ and how he's more than just a healer. You don't need to go to him all the time, just like, give me healing, give me healing. But he's so much more. And now I thought this may be a good time to write a book on the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to write it in a tone that invites everyone who would be a professing believer and, and hold to the true gospel to the table and find a lot of things we should agree on as essentials. And then if I was to present positions or offer thoughts on things or, Hey, here's something to consider, it would be from scripture. So then if people don't agree, they're going, all right, first of all, I know what I need to believe to be in the faith. Second, Costi made these claims from scripture and presented logical application. I don't agree. Here's why. Here's what I would say based on scripture. And now we're actually having fruitful discussions within the realm of pneumatology, goodness, that would be amazing. And then application would be the last thing I would add. Every chapter in the book has a section called learning to live, and it takes the truths and applies them because one thing that drives me nuts among others, but in our world, I'll pick on myself, is lots of theology, lots of doctrine. That is good. Absolutely. Give not an inch on that. But then there's little application. It's like, okay, what do we do? Or we're wowed by like Bible study facts. And we go, wow, that's amazing, man. And maybe on all fronts, we could say like guys who preach really well, they're real charismatic personalities. People are like, mm, that's good. Like that'll preach. It's like, okay, are you living it? So in all different fronts or on all different fronts, I thought we should apply these truths and there are implications. So all of that kind of just a bleeding heart over the doctrine of the Holy Spirit so we can relish in it and get it right. Amen. It's good. Amen. Well, uh, Costi, would you want to maybe just for those of our viewers who maybe aren't as familiar with your story, you you mentioned you were in the prosperity gospel kind of heretical side of that and moved into the reformed space. Uh, obviously, we're not going to do like a full scale autobiography today, but uh, could you just uh, just share kind of the highlights of a few of your just your experience in moving from one into the other so we can kind of get a a, a greater fuller picture uh, of who Costi Hinn is. Yeah, that is something I can do and I'll I'll shoot to do this really briefly. The uh the driver on it would be doctrine. And what I mean by that is the attributes of God. Why I would say that I was in heresy is because and blasphemy is because my view of God was entirely skewed. He was a magic genie. If I rubbed him right, if you will, with enough faith, big enough offerings, or I did enough of the right things that he would bless me and show favor on me with money, uh, perfect marriage, big house. I mean, 
pretty much the high life. I grew up in that. My uncle is Benny Hinn and needs very little introduction. My father was very similar, actually worked with my uncle Benny as well, in addition to pastoring his own church. And so, you know, I grew up and my normal was flying on a private plane with my uncle, uh, growing up in a 10,000 square foot house, having multiple homes, uh, driving, a like I, I went to Dallas Baptist university and played baseball there. And I drove an H two on 22s with TV screens in it. And like, it just, mm. I wore a Breitling watch. It was like a $10,000 watch. That was my normal. And the reason we lived that lifestyle was not because my dad was a, a real estate tycoon or, or even just like pastors today. I'm not a, an advocate for that, like the poverty gospel. Like, oh, if you serve the Lord, you have to have nothing. Like, it's fine. Paul talks about double honor for elders and faithful pastors, and we can make our living preaching the gospel. That's a, that's a privilege. But we really preached, if you give money, God will heal you. If you give a big enough offering, and we put numbers on it, like we would make stuff up. Like, I just feel an anointing tonight for audacious faith and audacious generosity. People are like, oh, here we go. And we'd go, I just, I feel like God is telling me right now that he's going to bless the number seven. It's the number of completion. You start talking fast. People are like, all right. And you go, I want you to get your checkbook. I want you to get your credit card. Go to the phone right now. And I want you to give. Some of you give $7. Some of you give $77. Some of you give $700, $777. And some of you, it's uncommon, an uncommon gift for uncommon faith, for an uncommon blessing. 7,777, you know, all that stuff. That mm. was the game, guys. So mm. all around the world, internationally, we stayed in the nicest hotels. One time, a layover in Dubai, we stayed in the Royal Suite at the Burj Al Arab, 25K a night. Mm. You know, it's, that was the life. So there were there's Pentecostal pastors, Assembly of God pastors that are like, y'all are blaspheming heretics you are giving us all a bad name you know take a hike or repent that is why i would use that phrase the gospel was like gospel plus yeah jesus died for your sins but and then you add anytime you have a but or an and you've you've really messed with the gospel and then when you have a skewed view of god who in the world are you worshiping i got saved as a pastor at a church we're sort of a seeker sensitive church uh and I was up to preach the healing at the pool of Bethesda and granted a lot of seeds planted in my life. I'll give you like the, the 60 second version here and then we can move on. But my coach at Dallas Baptist university, Dan Hefner, coach Heef was always leaking in good theology and he wasn't like trying to change me DBU, like Carrie Job would come sing at our school. We had uh, like Shane and Shane. There were a lot of different churches and different people. It was like no one was saying, hey, it's Benny Hinn's nephew. Let's hose him with reform doctrine. It was general SBC <laughs> type stuff. Well, Coach was always talking about the sovereignty of God, trusting the Lord. He would quote Proverbs 21.1, say the heart of a king is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. And he'd go, guys, he controls kings. He controls scouts. He is sovereign. Trust him. You just play the game. You live your life. You believe, trust in the Lord, and he'll take care of everything else. And I used to think, like, who's this Baptist dude with his white Toyota Camry, which is what he drove at the time? And, like, I got a Hummer. I got a Breitling watch in my locker right now. I'm li like, I know about getting God to do what I want. Like, what is this sovereignty stuff? Like, you just trust him and just sit around all passive? Like, oh, typical frozen chosen, typical Baptist, bunch of dead Christians, don't even have the power of the Spirit, don't have faith. I know what it takes to get God to get on my side and do what he wants to do. I know how to get him to work. It's faith. It's this. So I'm always looking down on these Baptist kids and my coach, but I love them. They're my teammates, but spiritually I'm going, no, you, you guys just don't have that thing. And within the family, we'd say those Baptists teach a solid word, but they have no power. Or we would call them dead churches growing up. And years later, I go to preach John five healing at the pool of Bethesda and it's this example of Jesus's healing ministry in action. The man doesn't have faith, doesn't have enough faith. He complains, he whines, <laughs> he doesn't even know who mm -hmm. Jesus is. Jesus heals him. And I'm going, what in the world? So a friend of mine had given me a commentary by some guy named John MacArthur. I'm like, whatever. I don't know much about any of that. And, you know, if, if, if it was in like movie terms, 
you could pick who your character is, but you know, if like you got MacArthur and, and Batman and you got my uncle and the Joker in the reformed world, it's like the ultimate, you know, villain and whatever their qualm, I don't, I'm not thinking about any of that at that moment. I don't even know much about it. And I read, and in that particular section, whether people agree with MacArthur on a lot or not, in that section, he tees off on the fact that this is an example of Jesus's sovereign healing power in action. The man did Amen. nothing to impress God, nothing mm -hmm. to earn merits with Jesus. Jesus healed him because he loved him. He just chose to heal him. And he said, it's a beautiful picture of the sovereignty of God and how he enters into our situation. And I'm like, that's true, no matter what your theological background, praise God. And then he goes off on this tangent and it pierces my heart. He says, and therein is one of the cruelest lies of faith healers today, that the people they fail to heal are guilty of negative confession, unbelief, all that. And I was like, what in the world? That's me. I believe that. I, And mm -hmm. honestly, my whole life flashed before my eyes type moment. My coach, because MacArthur's commentating, you can't turn his healing ministry into formula. Jesus is a sovereign healer. And sovereignty hits me like a ton of bricks. That God is in control. I exist for him. He's not a puppet on my string. I am his servant. I literally exist. Like we prayed before this. We exist for his glory. That's why we want to bring him glory. Amen. And the paradigm shifts. I'm no longer a man-centered, uh, saturated individual where the gospel, everything's about me. Now it's a vertical way of thinking. Everything's about you, Lord, and I want to know your word. So I went into study and I began looking at everything I believed. We had had a lot of other details go down, and that's why I wrote the book, God, Greed, and the Prosperity Gospel. Um, but overall, I said, okay, I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to build my doctrinal view based on the Bible. I'm going to study hard, land where I land, and figure out what's what. So that was the journey. That's like a decade ago, though. At this point, um, you know, those are those are just great memories, and I'm thankful for the Lord. But I just want to be a faithful pastor in all that I do. Hey, praise God, man. I mean, I think that's uh, maybe that's a great way to take off into the next part of our conversation because we, you know, having that law gospel distinction is super important. Okay, that the law says do, gospel says done. That we're we're living our life through what Christ has done for us, not what we have to do in order to manipulate God. And, and that, that phrase that you said that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm driving around in a Humber. I've got a nice watch. I know how to get God to do for me what I want him to do. That again, makes God this impersonal force, this, uh, this, this thing that frankly, if I do all the right things, I can actually control God uh, rather than God being the one in control. And that kind of tells into our conversation about the work of the Holy spirit. The people who are watching this, um, are going to make the case. Okay. Well, I would say the vast majority of people who watch this would hold to what would be a tis, uh, historically like a Nicene, uh, our articulation of the Trinity. I, I'm sure that there are heretics watching, but but for the vast majority of the people who come to this show uh, every single week would hold to uh, the doctrine of the th the Trinity, the the three persons and the one divine being that is God, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, who proceeds from the Father. And I think we're Westerners, so we will add and the Son, uh, right, who's spoken through the prophets. He's the Lord, the giver of life. Can you maybe just give a case? Because there may be people who are jiving into the show, again, that, that aren't... Uh, aren't regulars here who don't have a, a Nicene kind of formulation of who the Trinity is. Can you maybe articulate why the Holy Spirit is in fact a person and not a force, not uh, something that the Father and the Son come together and like, you know, uh, transcend energies to the earth or it's the Spirit of Christ, but, but the Holy Spirit is an actual third person of the Trinity. Could you make your case for that? Yeah, I do this in in the book right off the bat, because I think it's one of the most important things. And if I could just add a couple elements to this, I think there's three things that all of us should believe and relish in and embrace. And the first is that the Holy Spirit is God. He is there in the beginning Amen. of creation and all the way through from Old Testament history into through the prophets, into the gospels, into the New Testament. Um, one of my favorite examples is Acts chapter five, verse four in the New Testament, when Ananias and Sapphira have lied and Peter says, "You, why have you devised this in your heart to lie to God? And then he says, you've not lied to, or to lie to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you've not lied to men, but you've lied to God. And all the way through, uh, we see that he conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary, you know, on and on and on deity. So first of all, he's God. We got to believe the Holy Spirit is God. Now, second, he is a person. He's uh, God 
and a member of the Godhead. Therefore, he is a person, just like the Father and the Son. And where we look at the scriptures and find his personhood is in all of these expressions in the text where he searches, he speaks, he feels. I mean, he can be grieved. Paul talks about that mm -hmm. in Ephesians 4, 29. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He fills one of my favorite ones, though, Romans 8, 26. He intercedes. He's literally praying for you. Paul says there in Romans 8, 26 that the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And now we can think of, well, he's the helper. He helps us how. And Paul says he prays. He intercedes for you with groanings too deep for words. He, meaning when you don't know what to pray, you don't know what to do, you can literally thank the Holy Spirit that he is interceding for you. All of these are uh, representations of personhood. This is not a, an it. This is not a force. This is not a distant deity. This is the third member of the Trinity, active. He gives gifts. We're baptized by one spirit. We're filled by the Holy Spirit. A couple other ones uh, where Paul says, walk by the spirit and you won't carry out mm -hmm. the deeds of the flesh. That means the Greek word peripateo means to be preoccupied with the things of the Spirit. Now we're going, okay, what are the things of the Spirit? Well, that means he has a will, he has volition, he has desire for us and a plan and purposes and commands, and he bears fruit in us. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he's got all of the aspects of deity, all of the aspects of personhood in relation to how the Godhead is described. And therefore, he's God, he's a person. So third, he is personal, meaning you should have a relationship with him. He's not relegated to uh, some mystical force or wind or, or blue mist or, or magic genie or whatever people have used to describe him, nor is he um, some other thing that people would describe in mystical forms. He is personal. And this is where I think people need to really kind of grab on to biblical theology in all cases where there's extremes we've missed the target in extremes like let's say people in the charismatic movement that overdo the mystical force aspect and and sort of just treat them like this this uh floating you know thing to be conjured field. yeah and you're going okay fly over to the other extreme and go all right well in the reform community since John 16, 14 says he exists to glorify me and all he does is really exist to glorify Christ. We don't want to talk about him much. We don't want to acknowledge him much. We don't want to make a very big deal about him. We just kind of need to, let's just pray to the Father, talk about the Son, and, you know, uh, holy, thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and sanctification. Blah, blah, blah. We kind of trail off. And I'm not making up a caricature here. So anybody who says, oh, come on, what are you talking about us for like that? We're the reform types. And they expect me to just, play for the home team and say nothing. I talked to reform pastor after reform pastor after reform pastor who would who have said all these things. I just put them in writing and have even talked to many Pentecostals who go, we need to get this right. I think we we need to all place more attention on biblical truth than we have. And what that'll do, it's not about the other guys. It's about us and our heart and saying, all right, where does the Holy Spirit want to teach me something? Where can I be sharper than ever? Where can I be more biblical than ever? Where can I be more balanced than ever? Do that on all sides. And I'll be honest with you guys, tomorrow, launch day, uh, there's an interview coming out with Destiny Image Publishers, Bethel's publisher. I did an interview with Larry Sparks. And he said, you know, people will be mad at him for having me on. I said, now oh, there's reformed people that'll be annoyed with me for going on. But Larry and I talked in the interview. We didn't even, we didn't debate. We, we don't agree with each other on, on several things, but it was so remarkable. He was talking about the need for their community to become deeper in soteriology. And I, I was basically listening to him preach uh, what we would call reform soteriology, but just biblical soteriology, that God is the great initiator of salvation. He grabs hold of the heart. And he's like, we got to get deeper in this. We didn't even get to the things we don't agree on because we were too busy talking about tier one things. That would be my proposal for all of us is where are the areas that you're shallow in? Go deeper, dig mm -hmm. in. And for you, if you're listening to this or you're watching 
and you have not come to an understanding that the Holy Spirit is God, you need to get there. I pray you do. Look at the scriptures. You'll find he's God. And if you've not gotten to the place where you believe he's a person and you treat him like a person and you honor him as the third person of the Trinity, well, you have a deficient view of the Trinity. Therefore, I would say you have a deficient, a deficient view of the gospel and an understanding of the God who saves you or could save you. And I would surrender my life to him immediately and see that the Holy Spirit is an active person. And if maybe you're a Christian, you're well-intentioned, you kind of call him an it, or you've fallen into one of these extremes, I would say push out all the noise and just let the Bible drive the bus. And I mean, I hope that the book is a trigger for that, but that you would do your own study and get there. So those would be things that I would share from my heart about his deity, mm -hmm. his personhood, and then the relationship with him. That's fantastic. Okay. Amen. Uh, well, maybe even to dive in on the relationship, like what does that, uh, I guess, what does that mean? What does it look like? Where would you go into the Bible for that? I know you mentioned walk by the spirit. I've heard Patrick Schreiner, or maybe read uh, him talk about, uh, the scholar Tom Schreiner's son, uh, talk about mm -hmm. the, the Holy Spirit being the shy person of the Trinity. Uh, you know, he makes much of Christ, especially, uh, or I think of First John 1, where John will say, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And it's like, but what about the Holy Spirit? So like, it, how would you articulate what it means and looks like biblically and practically to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? It's a great question. First, I wouldn't build an entire theology on, you know, John not mentioning the Holy Spirit there. Mm -hmm. Many times biblical authors say certain things a certain way, and that's just what they wrote right there and then. Um, so that would be number one. Number two, when you look across, like you look at Paul's ministry, there's a great deal of mention regarding the Holy Spirit. So, you know, did John have more of a dry, reformed stoicism and Paul was the charismatic? You know, we would we would want to be so careful uh, mm -hmm. imposing our views on the text. Uh, I love the Shriners. Actually, Tom Shriner gets mentioned in the book. His book on spiritual gifts is super helpful and informative for me. I appreciate his tone and the winsomeness with yeah, Pentecostals like and too. with other views. Really, really appreciate the Shriners. Um, I would say what Patrick's maybe alluding to would be the nature of the Holy Spirit's ministry. I don't like calling him shy. That doesn't mean that Pat's wrong. It just I don't like calling him shy because, again, that's putting a, 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 a human attribute on him like he's shy and now we're into the whole you know he's just over there and he's he's sensitive and he's he's almost like oh please don't offend me or grieve me and look that can swing to both camps the reform camp and then the charismatic camp where maybe you guys have seen this some of this stuff before i was in services all the time growing up where i mean you go to the bathroom i'm not being uh hyperbolic you go to the bathroom a baby cries or you so much as move like i was a catcher and if you moved at the wrong time or you weren't like praying in tongues when they were praying for people, they would tell you or the anointed leader would say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And you're like, OK, sorry, I didn't mean to move. I mean, Catherine mm -hmm. Coleman was famous for that in her meetings. And I'm not trying to pick on everyone's heroes. If that's somebody you just idolize and you adore, look, the, the, they're human. And that teaching was so prevalent as though we need to walk on eggshells because you might scare them away. So I don't like the, the term shy because it doesn't actually match what the Bible describes. Why don't we just treat them normal, meaning biblical? What does he do? He fills, baptizes, gives gifts. He controls, he brings us into submission. He helps us glorify Christ. So when I say relationship with the Holy Spirit, I mean pray that he would do in you, through you, and to you what the Bible says he does. So what would that look like in your prayer life? You might say, Father, thank you for sending Christ to die for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for paying for my sin. Thank you for calling me to a life of discipleship. Help me to bring glory to your name and honor you. You might even say, Holy Spirit, fill me today. Bring me in total submission to the will of God. Help me to bear fruit. Help me to bring glory to Christ. Keep me under control because my sin, my mouth, and my mind 
frequently get the best of me. I need you today. Thank you for indwelling me and sealing me for the promise that is to come because you are my pledge. Help me today to be faithful in whatever I do. Grant me wisdom. Help me to love the word and to desire to fulfill my purpose. Like That would be a Trinitarian prayer. So when people hear me, mm-hmm. even recently, um, some people are like, oh, where in the Bible is it? You know, pray to the Holy Spirit. I'm not praying to the Holy Spirit. That's false teaching. I'm going, you people like keep making stuff up because you just go, well, I don't like that or that doesn't fit into one of my reformed systematic theology textbooks. Well, think about this biblically. I'm not saying to pray to the Holy Spirit and say, thank you for dying on the cross. I'm not saying to, you know, you would just pray in line with Trinitarian roles, the same way that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we acknowledge that our God is three in one because there's a clear picture. All I'm saying is to use the power of prayer, use the, the license to approach God and talk to him, God, in three persons, in his role or the roles of the members of the Trinity. And that's more of a personal way to approach him. I think having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, though, begins with the gospel when you're saved and he takes residence in you, I just have a really difficult time theologically ignoring, downplaying, and I don't know, just barely and rarely acknowledging the member of the Trinity who's inside of me right now. He's literally in me. If we're believers, Mm -hmm. he's in you. If we're gathered together, we're worshiping, his presence is saturating our hearts, our lives. He's there we're his temple. And then it's like, don't talk about him. So again, not being hyperbolic or creating caricatures. Let's just talk about him the way the Bible says to and pray to him or acknowledge his work the way the Bible would call us to. If that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I think it's, it's part of the difficulty that we've had with in church history um, for people who have watched some of our content on the doctrine of the Trinity. uh, You would know that in, I think 325 when the Nicene Creed is initially formulated, uh, it's something to the effect of and the Holy Spirit, right? We believe and the Holy Spirit. Uh, And and then later it's added uh, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son, whom with the father and son is worshiped and glorified. And, And that phrase is important because the idea was, um, uh, what, what, what do we do with God? We pray to God. We worship God. Well, who is God? Well, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And if you can make the statement, we should worship God, then, then it logically follows that you should worship the Father, you should worship the Son, and you should worship the Spirit. And if you can say, theologically, again, I pray to God, well, then how, how, how do you pray to God? Well, you can pray to the Father because the Father is God. You can pray to the Son because the Son is God. And you can pray to the Spirit because the Spirit is God. And, and, and Basil would have made, the I think, the, the, the case for the Spirit's work, both in prayer and in worship. That was his emphasis was on the work of the Spirit. So I'm curious, though, uh, when it comes to the work of the Spirit, you mentioned these kinds of extreme, these polar opposites. You know, when you talk about the charismatic movement and the work of the Spirit, it's like he does the ghosty stuff, right? Healing the sick, prophesying. He does he does those kinds of activities in the charismatic space. And and you mentioned the reform space as well. Like, well, the Spirit is the one who you know uh, you know draws us by by his power, you know, uh, to the Father and 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 wa- or to the Son, I should say, and washes and presents us before the Father in you know, this kind of clean and holy and separate and different. So it's like the Spirit's work is soteriological in the Reformed space, whereas in most of the charismatic space, the work of the Spirit comes after salvation and some kind of subsequent empowerment of the Spirit in supernatural works. Uh, could you maybe like speak into both sides of that and, and, and talk about the work of the Spirit and how both sides actually need to deepen their knowledge and experience of the work of the Spirit? Um, I, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, a Paul Washer sermon that I think it was released like six months ago. Maybe it's new, maybe it's old, and I just saw it, that the timestamp was six months ago, on his talk on Pentecost and how we need the power of the Spirit. We need to be clothed with power from on high, and that that needs to be a, a language that we can speak of when we're talking about the work of the Spirit. So can you maybe, again, just kind of weigh in on both sides, the Reformed side, the hyper-charismatic side, and just talk about how we, on both sides, need to grow and deepen in our knowledge and theological language of the work of the Spirit? Yeah, I would be... Uh washer-esque in in my views a lot of what he says resonates with me and i i think that comes from i've talked to him personally a little bit and listened to him mostly when i'm when i've been around him it's best to i just 
shut up and listen. Costi, this seems weird. I think your mic is might be getting quieter. Can I have you like like turn up your mic? Is that a chance? Or maybe yeah. even just position it. Can you hear it. me now? Yeah, absolutely. Better? I can still hear you. It's just kind of quiet. Oh, sorry. How about now? That's better. Thanks, man. Awesome. Okay. I was just saying I would resonate with Washer on, on a number of fronts. Uh, I don't know if it's because he was on the mission field. I don't know if it's just because he's a deep soul. A lot of people call him a Puritan. He calls Joel Beakey the last of the Puritans. I mean, there's some reform guys that are dead serious about the Holy Spirit's work. And I, I resonate with them. I appreciate the way they approach it because all the doctrinal uh, train wheels are on the track there just seems to be this vibrancy in their prayer life. And I was at uh, G3 in 2021 and Washer was very, very clear. He said, now I am reformed Baptist. And you're like, okay, what, what's he about to say? And he says, but you will not take the supernatural away from me. And he was, he was going off about having a vibrant, powerful, intimate, close, personal relationship with God and the triune God. And I appreciate that because I think it brings uh, a permission and an awareness to use certain language, to pray certain prayers, and to acknowledge the Holy Spirit's work and not have people in the room go, oh, that was that is this getting weird? Like, no, it's not. We're just asking him to do what he does. And newsflash, he's the one who was sent. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to fill us, mm -hmm. empower us, and to do these things through us and in us. So acknowledge his work. On the flip side, uh, yeah, I think the the charismatic camp, uh, whatever you want to call it, would do really well to not dip their toes in soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, because the, the Greek word soteria, literally meaning to redeem or rescue, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, but immerse yourself in it, uh, obsess over it, relish in it, and spending more time there, I think will balance out potentially some of the excesses and what seems to be an overemphasis on encounter and even the language of breakthrough and encounter and all of that is very post-conversion language and very, now we, now we want the experience. Now we need the real and the fullness and Man, I would say you never graduate from the gospel. You never graduate from the Spirit's work in salvation. And I've I've Amen. talked to different guys that, you know, I ran into Todd White in the airport several months back, and we were in Hudson News, and we had a pretty big conversation in the middle of the airport. <laughs> you know, I I we had we had really honest things to say to each other, and it was good. And one of the things that I was trying to encourage him with is, man, like preach the gospel, the, the whole true gospel, the message. And like, what if that was enough one service? Like there was nothing more after and people got saved. Like, would that be enough? And of course he said yes. And you know, all of that, but that would be an example of what I would implore while maybe you guys might say like, would you guys relish a little more in his work and the relationship you have? Like take the theology and could we, could we get into more of those Paul Washer-esque moments where he's really praying for the empowerment of the Spirit, the way that Paul might when he's going in to a new mission field. And what that does, it immediately removes the, uh, the edge of my main fight is you guys. I got to take you out and take you down. And I got to deal with Bethel and I got to squash all that. And it immediately turns the mirror on me and goes, all right, I've got to go deeper. I've got to be biblical. And if you do that and I do that, then the sovereign Lord and the Holy Spirit in us will do his work accordingly. And the last chapter in the book is on unity for a reason, because I think we could find more unity and I'm not lobbying for some like, you know, oh, let's lay doctrine aside and just love people. I've done enough videos on that terrible phrase. Uh, to make sure that everyone knows where we stand on that. But brother, the, the idea that we can't find unity is crazy. Um, the idea that it's always someone else's issue and not ours is crazier because 
we need to grow personally. So That's that good. would be some of that. And if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I want to kind of keep digging into this sort of the charismatic cessationist side of things. I'll, I'll ask a question that maybe uh, unpack it a little bit, but like, uh, let's take the apostolic prayer of Acts chapter four. Uh, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness as you stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders to the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they, they're praying for boldness and they're praying for heal, for miraculous signs and wonders. Uh, do you feel that uh, do you feel that's a prayer you could pray that you could cheer people on saying, yes, that's a good prayer. That's an apostolic prayer. Uh, and, and so that's the question, but, but really kind of framed in the broader question of your journey, you moved from hyper charismatic into the reformed space, but still have this deep love and appreciation for the Holy spirit of the works of the spirit of the power of the Holy spirit. And so I'm kind of drilling down on, because I know every cessationist is going to say, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm all about the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to kind of drill in on even the definition of kind of power. Are we including healings and signs and wonders? Are we including visions and dreams? And kind of just what did you do with that whole part of the package that was part of your, your very, very charismatic world? What do you what do you do with that, and what do you recommend people do with that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I'm happy to answer it. I ended up after studying landing on a more non normative view of those things, and you mm -hmm. we a lot of people would say cessationism. That's the view. Okay, but it started for me as looking and saying, well, this is sort of a non normative pattern. Now I know that other people have different views and I, I uh, ran into Sam, Dr. Sam storms on an airplane mm -hmm. a couple months ago, and he gave me his new book, which is by Zondervan and it's on run into all and kinds I, of people in the airport. <laughs> I, you know what? The airport is the, is like where it's all going down, man. And it's always in Dallas. That was like, literally <laughs> was, go through <laughs> Dallas. I'm going to Dallas. I'm going to Dallas in a month. Who, who am I? Maybe I'll run into Kenneth Copeland. Although I don't know if that one's going to go as well. So, uh, Bob and Weave, the guy. Bob and Weave. <laughs> Bob and Weave. <laughs> need a Bob and Weave for sure. Uh, so I I study and I land on those being more non normative and being very common and completely regular in the life of the apostles as they lay the foundation for the church. I'm I view Ephesians two twenty as a great clarification text that we're mm -hmm. built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ is the cornerstone. And then we're being built up atop of that. I know that's like the classic, one of the classic uh, cessationist texts that we would look at. And that doesn't mean that I think everybody who doesn't agree with me is just a heretic or off their rocker. If they pray for these things, we just prayed for a guy in our church two weeks ago and he's got stage four cancer. We're a church plant. We meet at a school. And so there's like a, a weight room just off the gym the gymnasium where we meet and the elders and I, we all had already premeditated to pray for him that day. And, you know, we didn't anoint him with oil, but the James five prayer, the elders got around him. We prayed and we asked the Lord to heal him. And then we still say like Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Lord, your will be done. And look, this may shock some people, but that's been done for us. My son, Timothy, mm -hmm. he, uh, has LCH Langerhand cells, his Langerhand cell histiocytosis in the histio family, but it's a cancer like thing. And, um, it's in the cancer family and they're still doing a lot of research on it. But overall, uh, when we got the diagnosis, they were like, it's cancer. Well, our, uh, friends at that time and a lot of them got around us, they were praying for God to heal them. And then I was in an elder meeting one night at grace community church, John MacArthur. It was a Thursday night. I was invited way of some friends there. And I would go visit and do discipleship or get mentored or meet with different leaders who were really helpful for me. And we were there and they said, Hey, the elders would love to pray for Timothy tonight. And here's something that would maybe shock people. Uh, pastor John prayed that the Lord would heal Timothy and extend his days. And if that would be God's will, we always pray. If it be thy will, that's not a prayer of unbelief. That's a prayer of biblical parameters. And, and he said, Lord, we'd ask you to do that. And, that you'd receive glory no matter what, whether his days are short or long, all that prayed. And 
I'm not saying that John MacArthur has a healing ministry, but I'll tell you this, there had, there's never been an issue <laughs> since then. No joke. My wife, uh, he's got journaled it. She journaled God. it that night and it was super moving. And I've shared that story before. And then my joke is like, so John MacArthur has a really great healing ministry. You know, he healed my kid. That <laughs> it means that he's an apostle like the, like the 12. He, he is. I'm just so kidding. I'm just trying to make people uncomfortable. I'm really not. I don't see. Keep going. No, no, everybody, sorry. everyone calm down. We don't have to light everyone on fire. Uh, that in that sense, um, that would be where I land. Just what does the Bible show us as the church? Now we can pray for the Lord to heal. We trust his will. The apostles did those things in the normative way. And if we don't agree on that, it should be a family like discussion, but uh -huh. there are, are other things that can be more aggressive or stronger. Uh, that'd be in the realm of the gospel and twisting things or even, even abuse of things and, and over emphasis on things. We can correct each other sharply and help each other out with that. But in the end, I landed on those being more of a non-normative pattern. So I have no problem praying though for empowerment. I pray every week that the, I pray in line with what the Bible teaches about each member of the Trinity. And one of the mm -hmm. things I pray is for the Holy Spirit to fill me. Why? Ephesians 5.18 commands it. If I'm commanded to be being filled, which is an ongoing present active verb, well, I'm in all kinds of trouble if I don't believe in praying to the Holy Spirit. So what are you, you going to do to get filled? You pray? Yeah. You sing, yeah. Mm -hmm. You fill your life. You Colossians three sixteen. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Yeah. So, I look at that, and every week I pray before preaching. Holy Spirit, fill me for use for the glory of Christ. Fill me with your word. Fill me with power in my preaching. Save people. Open eyes. Illuminate their eyes to the truth. Help me to fulfill my duty and my purpose. Like. All of that, if someone said, oh, I can't believe, you shouldn't pray. That's that's getting a little weird. You're weird. Maybe you don't want power in your <laughs> preaching. I am utterly <laughs> dependent on the Holy Spirit. Aren't you? Maybe that's why you're boring. Maybe I'm boring. I don't care. People keep getting saved, though. So let me be boring if people get saved, as long as the Holy Spirit moves. And you could be wildly uh, entertaining, but you have no spirit empowerment. Great. Everyone likes you. They think you're cool, but nobody's getting saved. And then you got lots of doctrine and theology, but you don't pray for the empowerment of the spirit. Well, great. You're really smart. And now we all sit around like the frozen chosen fat on knowledge. I think what's, what levels the playing field, the work of the Holy spirit, plain and simple. So that's where mm -hmm. I would land on those things. If that helps. Great, Amen. Super and helpful. I, I think that's a fantastic word to you. And I think that, uh, the charismatic community needs to hear more, I think, um, from the other side of the aisle when it comes to subjects like this, when it comes to, um, again, my, my cessationist brothers, my, my Jeff Durbin's out there, um, you know, the cultish community, uh, the Doug Wilson's, even uh, my friend Matthew Tarpley, who's over in Lake Waccamaw, um, you know, Baptist Church, uh, First Baptist Church. Uh, these are guys who they are, you know, whether they're 1689 London Baptist guys, they're Presbyterian, they're, they are what would be typically considered cessationist, like you're saying, non-normative. Uh, but when I pray with these men, when I talk with these men, these are men who are like, I need the power of the Spirit, like we need God active. We live in this mystical world where God does supernatural things, don't take the supernatural away from the Christian. And there's a kind of, in the same way that there is a caricature of all charismatics for being hyper charismatic or nar, uh, there, there seems to be another characterization, I think, of the charismatics have of the cessationists, that, that cessationists can be uh, near deist. Like they can, they can believe that God has spun the world into existence and, and that the Holy Spirit definitely works in saving people. But after that, just kind of like lets things go um, and, and somehow God sovereignly works in things. But this, this idea, this concept that you are espousing that I heard from Paul Washer recently, that I hear from those other men that I mentioned a moment ago, these are men who are dependent on the power of the Spirit to, to live and active through their life when it comes to these things. I'd be curious, you know, you talked a moment ago about a kind of shallow version of unity. I think that each of us here want to avoid like the plague that says, let's just ignore our actual theological disagreements that matter, that are meaningful uh, as we're pushing on uh, to understand the gospel and understand God all the more. We shouldn't compromise on these things for some kind of shallow version of what unity is. 
is we actually should come to the table rigorously expecting to theologically debate one another and engage and sharpen one another in these subjects. What, what do you think looks like unity when it comes from the charismatic? And I'm not talking about maybe the, the hyper ends of both of that, because I think you and sure. I both know that's probably not going to happen, but maybe the middle ground, kind of the charismatic and cessationist group that's kind of more centralistic uh, in their views. Could, could you maybe speak to how you believe our conversations of the Holy Spirit need to happen so that we can drive one another back to the book, back to the text of Scripture, and, and, and try to find some semblance of biblical unity when it comes to the third person of the Spirit? The third yeah, person of the Trinity, the not the third person of the Spirit. Someone's going to take that clip and they're going to run with it. You know what I mean? Heretic. They're like, he thinks that there's nine Heretic. persons of the, uh, the Trinity like Benny Hen does. Sorry. It's okay. all over. You've done it again. You're, you're the reason I wrote the book. Yeah. No, <laughs> the, uh, what would unity look like? I think in the, in the last chapter, this is in the book. So um, I think people will enjoy it and it'll be encouraging and soothing for humility maybe is probably one of the first things. Uh, having a humble heart that says, Amen. I can learn something from you, or I can listen and be encouraged. I can listen and be sharpened. Or how about this? I can listen and understand. We use, I try, I, I fail at this at times, but HMU, like the phrase, help me understand. So help me understand what your view is on this and what you mean when you say that. Uh, I talked to someone recently who was saying, the Lord told me, the Lord told me all the time. And I said, Hey, I got a question for you. I didn't, I didn't say anything the first time you said it. And then later on I said, Hey, so quick question for you. Just help me understand. When you say the Lord told me, what are you, um, are you hearing him audibly? Like what's your approach? And the reason I ask is because I've never heard him audibly, but I used to use that phrase. And I think what I meant is I had a feeling sometimes I was using it manipulatively. So not saying you are, but help me understand. What do you mean? And all I've done is put in front of them my genuine question, my own experience as well. So I'm asking them to weigh in on maybe they've had a different experience, but I, I want to share mine. I mean, that's usually what people end up debating over is like, well, I've seen this and I've seen some stuff. Oh, well, I've seen some stuff. And now we're just in this debate of experience, but I've shared that. I've asked them to help me understand. And in that conversation, the brother said, well, actually, no, I'm not hearing them audibly. I never have. I know people that have or say they have, but I never have. It's just an expression that I'm saying, I feel like that's what the Lord is directing me to do in my heart. And he's like, how would you express it? And I said, I would say the Lord, you know, I'm reminded of what the Lord said is in the word. He's like, okay. And I said, he said, what if it's like not a Bible verse? I was like, well, I might say, you know, I've got a real strong conviction that we ought to do this. And, you know, that's all I would say. Then they know if I'm engaging, okay, Costi's got a conviction about this. But I might say, you know, after reading this passage or after praying this morning, you know, I came out of my time with the Lord in prayer with just the strongest conviction to make that call, ask that person if they would like this, this, and we should that, that. And they, I, I really think they need to this. That's all I would say. And he was like, you know, that may help some confusion. I, I had to try that more often. It's probably better. And that way, if there's people, and he was, he's definitely charismatic. He said, you know, that way, if the people who are really hearing him audibly say that, that's fine. But like, I should just be accurate. And here's the deal. Do I think God speaks audibly as a regular normative pattern? No. Do I think that everyone who's saying the Lord told me is telling the truth? No, I don't. Can I understand more though, that this guy was just using the phrase as an expression. Yes. Would I encourage him to say it differently? Absolutely. It'll be less confusing for folks. However, we didn't end up lighting each other on fire. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he took what I said and was reasonable. I took what he said and was, he asked me questions. I asked him questions. So what I think is at the core of that is a humility. I'm genuinely not trying to destroy you, slam you and end you. And then say, told you, I'm right. I'm trying to get in your head and your heart and see through your eyes. If I can do that, then maybe it's a, it's a slight encouragement to use different language. Or if yeah. someone's really lost and confused or deceptive, it's a, listen, I'm telling you right now, you ought to really think deeply. And I would encourage you to study the word and change that position. You're on a dangerous path. 
The yeah. difference between that and the other stuff is, you know, there's a lot less hand grenades in what we've talked about. So humility and love would be another one. Do I yeah. actually love the person I'm talking to? I could just leave that there. It, <laughs> if you can't say you love someone, you love their soul. We love because he first loved us. That I, I love my uncle. When I say strong things or have about him in the past, I'm, I love him. I've said things privately. I've gone to family members. I've made the calls. I've had the, I've had the bad like phone calls where you're just going at it at each other. And I've had the, the good ones where you're crying and pleading. I've, I've sent the emails. I've sent the text messages. Like you, you love people. Otherwise who cares? Just go make money, run over all of them, do your thing. But if you love people, you actually want to help them. And there could be emotions there. I think that's why sometimes we, some of us get frustrated is we're, we're really passionate because there's a lot of love. We're really fearful for that person. We're scared because we know what is going to come if they keep on this path and we know things and, and we're aware of things. And so I think love has to compel. And isn't that what Paul says? I mean, nothing I'm saying is novel. Like, you know, this is Costi's opinion or, well, that's what Costi says, but I don't agree. Hello. Paul said, love controls us. It, that's the goal of our instruction. That's the driving motive. Love from a sincere heart. So are, are you sincere? And I would lobby for this. The reform types, get to know people, try to understand where they're coming from, then make a decision on where you think they're at. And conversely, to the charismatics who might think like, the cessationists, the cessationists don't believe in the Holy Spirit. It, it, kind, you know, woman recently said, you know, I, I believe the Holy Spirit ended at the apostles. And I'm like, okay. And someone was like, do you believe that? And I said, so first of all, your friend is what she's trying to express is that I believe that certain gifts or roles, even offices, the apostles were at the beginning of the church or, or foundational and not normative now. So that's what she's saying. He's like, Oh God, you believe in the Holy spirit? I'm like, of course I do I have a book coming out on him that even that like try to receive their information a certain way and try not to paint us all as spirit quenching blasphemers who are broad brushing and Amen. that helps too. So both sides, maybe it's not, always great but maybe it's not always as bad as we think or they're not as heretical as we think they are yeah well costi i uh i love your tone in this conversation i think it's exactly what we need there are lots of people out there the charismatics or in the uh, cessation space who are routinely posting that josh and i are not even christians because we're charismatics which is just silly talk and uh and i just i appreciate your perspective and tone and just talking about this i think that's what we need uh when it comes to unity i don't think the unity of the spirit is we all agree down to tertiary doctrines and mm -hmm. uh i i think the unity of the spirit is that we're all looking to christ and uh and your tone i think really helps that so uh excited for your book to be released uh tomorrow and um we're at the really a little bit past our one hour mark love to hear if you have any closing thoughts i'll maybe uh volley it over first to josh and give you a chance costy to think of what kind of nutshell you'd like to, people to walk home with but um first josh for you do you have uh do you have a golden nugget for people that's just kind of like your one take away. And then Costi will ask you the same question right, right after that. Man, I'd say go pick up Costi's book. I mean, uh, go, go check it out. It, like it releases the next day or two, uh, pick it up on Amazon. Um, yeah, go purchase the book, go, go read it. If you're a charismatic, um, it's going to be good for you to understand the other side. I mean, we are constantly recommending books on the work of the spirit, the activity of the spirit here on the channel uh, and to read someone from the other side, I think is part of the intellectual honesty that we owe our brothers in Christ who are on the other side. So it, it, I'd, encourage you to go pick it up. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, knowing the spirit, Costi Hen, it'll pull up. You should be able to find it very quick. Um, and and I would just thank Costi for coming on. Man, I know this has been a conversation a long time coming. You mentioned that you're going to get a bit of flack for probably going on Destiny Image. 
newsflash if you don't already know it you're gonna get some flack from coming on this channel um but uh, uh but i i commend you for doing it man I, I appreciate it i don't think things get better until we start having some conversations and reading uh, on the other side of the aisle and and expanding a little bit of our theological vocabulary so i appreciate your work on the subject and i encourage people to go pick up that book yeah i would encourage people to be so cautious and so slow with uh with big railing judgments there might be a difference between um you know taking selfies and being like hey you know and and just being like yeah who cares what we believe and and this kind of thing where we go on a podcast and we have dialogue and you know i i don't know if the headlines tomorrow will read costi hin joins remnant radio to become charismatic uh they they missed the boat missed the point we, we usually do that on our second or third episode we'll have you back on and we'll, we'll convert you but Got that's it. not that's not for this Got time. it. There, or, or read the book and i'll convert you you know, oh yeah, we don't go either way. <laughs> you can, but I, here's what I would encourage people uh, who read the book. There, I hope, is a tone that is fair and loving, that believes the best and and speaks well in a way that still doesn't give an inch on the truth and the essentials, and then at the same time, on areas where there's disagreement. Uh, hopefully, and and my goal is you you should see this in the book. I've argued from scripture. We just might interpret it differently or we come to the table with different views, but ultimately there's respect as we think, okay, this is too far. That's too far. Here's where we're going to kind of live. And then we, we may not land even the same, but we're still in the same arena. Uh, all of that should be clear. And I really also would hope that you spend several chapters being incredibly edified by a great number of truths we agree on. And then maybe in the baptism or tongues or in spiritual gifts, someone doesn't agree. And then in the worship chapter, yeah, I think you'll find more unity there than you might imagine. And then of course, in the Spirit's work through revelation and the Word of God and in unity, I, you know, there'd probably be more to like than, than you might think. So I hope it's an encouragement and, and sharpens us all. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Costi, thanks again for joining us. You guys make sure and check out his book. comes out tomorrow. And uh, everybody else, thanks again uh, for joining us. We have the Remnant Radio Conference coming up at, uh, at my church, Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City. And so that's going to be this weekend. If you haven't bought your tickets, there are some left. So uh, make sure you check that out. Links in the description. And uh, make sure you like this video, share it, in, uh, share it around, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you on Wednesday talking about discernment of spirits. So uh, God bless you guys and have a great week. Yeah. Costi, just heads up. Screen's going to go black if you'd stay on. We'll, we'll chat with you here in a sec.